Um, we're going to jump in and we're looking at both the cocktails that we're looking at are going to be bourbon based. Uh, Bullet Bourbon is a, is a, a brand that I've worked with quite a bit uh, over the years. They are really, um, to me, a gold standard in American whiskey. Uh, I've been, I was just down to the distillery. I actually taught a class not unlike this uh, at their distillery about a year ago. Um, and I've worked with the team quite a bit. It's just very indicative of um, when I think of what an American um, whiskey in, in the bourbon or rye category should taste like, it's uh, bullet is, is spot on. Uh, it's also pretty inexpensive and it's very easy to find, which is great. You don't have to break the bank for this stuff. You know, you're for around, for a big bottle, um, you know, really around $30 at, at some place like Mariano's or whatnot. Uh, so it's it's not too bad. And, it, and for making cocktails, we don't need to break the bank. We don't need to um, get a, a 60 or $70 bottle of whiskey when we're making cocktails for the stuff that if we're sipping something neat, definitely um, go with your favorites. But I put this on ice as well, and I'm very, very, very happy um, to sip it. So when I talk about American whiskey a, uh, a bit, how many whiskey drinkers do we have out there? Any bourbon fans out there? Almost everybody. Awesome. Um, just a couple of notes on this. So uh, bourbon is uh, its uh, production is regulated. Uh, it can be made anywhere in the United States. It is not just in Kentucky. It is not just in Bourbon County. By the United States law, um, it can be made anywhere in the U.S., but no whiskey outside of the U.S. can be labeled bourbon. Uh, agreement in the same way that we respect the Champagne region of France or Sherry from Jerez or, you know, no agave spirit can be called tequila. That's not made in the states that are regulated uh, in Mexico. Uh, the same thing happens for bourbon. Uh, you'll notice if you see uh, this on the store shelf, there's often a bottle next to it that has a green label and that's uh, rye whiskey. Uh, and the difference is the, the production laws and everything surrounding it are actually nearly identical, um, but bourbon, the base and the majority of um, what we call the mash bill or the mix of grains that go into making your whiskey uh, has to be predominantly corn. Uh, and and, and in the case of bullet, it also has uh, some rye. It has a kiss of uh, barley in it as well, which helps with fermentation. When you have rye whiskey, it's a majority, at least 51% of the rye grain, typically a little bit spicier than bourbon, uh, a little bit less rounded. Uh, and so it's really just preference. Any of the cocktails we're making tonight, you can certainly make with uh, an American rye whiskey uh, or whatever it is. If you're, if you're feeling frisky uh, and you, and you, you know, you want to do a, the 10 year version of this uh, bullet makes a 10 year. And if you've had a, uh, you know, if it's been a really long Monday, they also make a barrel strength uh, edition of that whiskey as well. So the first cocktail that we're going to make uh, is one of my favorites. It's actually, it was the cocktail that I had. I've been bartending for a little over uh, 20 years. And it was the cocktail that gave me my aha moment, if you will. Uh, I don't know, like I can think back um, uh, to um, remember the first real cup of coffee I had that made me question uh, what the heck have I been drinking all these years? And it was um, from the guys over at Dark Matter Coffee when they only had Star Lounge on Chicago Avenue. And I was sitting with the owner and we were doing a coffee tasting. And I was like, ah, this is coffee. What garbage have I been drinking my whole life? And it woke me up. I can remember the first cocktail that was given to me as well. That was like just a simple whiskey sour made with just bourbon, fresh lemon juice, simple syrup, egg white, and a little bit of bitters. And it was given to me by the woman who had become my mentor. Uh, and I was like, what have I been drinking all of these years? Like this simple, very easy to make cocktail um, blew my mind, you know, no sour mix off the gun. And I know that sounds a little bit Passe now at this point, but just 10 years ago, finding a place that was working with all fresh ingredients and making their cocktails from scratch to this level that we're going to be working at today uh, was a stretch and it was pretty hard to find. And luckily, standards are, are, are raising all the time. And it's because of you guys, you decide where you spend your hard earned money, where you go to drink, where you go to, to dine. Uh, and when you demand that you're um, cocktails have as much attention given to them as the food that you're eating, those restaurants will answer very, very quickly. And we're seeing this cocktail movement explode uh, out. All right. So 
we're going to get into making this cocktail. You sh all should have a shaker of some sort. Uh, this is the cocktail shaker that was included in the set. Um, so does everyone have some sort of cocktail shaker or something to shake a drink in? So we'll talk about this real quickly as well, just kind of from a bar tool standpoint. Um, the tool, all the tools that I'm using and the tools that were in the kit, uh, I, about um, in 2016, I had the opportunity to work with an amazing um, uh, tableware producer uh, out of, they were based in Virginia, just outside of DC. And they approached me and said, have you ever thought about making your own bar tools? And I'm like, yes, I have for the last 20 years uh, thought about that. I have lots of opinions about everything cocktail related. Uh, and, and so we were able to design and spec out um, a, a full line of bar tools and glassware. And that's what you're seeing here. This style that I have in my hand, you will hear referred to as a Boston shaker um, or a two piece shaker or 10 on 10. Uh, and this is really the choice of most professional bartenders. If you go around the city and the suburbs, you're going to see this two piece shaker, something that looks similar to this, uh, might be slightly stylistically different. Um, but that is going to be by far what professional bartenders use. The other type of shaker, uh, which most, most of us end up having in our homes because we got them gifted to us or it's what they had at the big box store or whatnot, is what we call the cobbler shaker or a three-piece shaker. It's got the little cap on top. It's got this secondary piece and then either glass or tin on the bottom. Uh, these you see used in some places. If you go over to Japan, which has a very... Um, particular style and a very signature style of making cocktails. They typically use cobbler shakers and they're very small. They make one, one cocktail at a time in them. Uh, it's a, um, they just have, they're just uh, very methodical about everything that they do. It's a very slow and intentional way of, of making a cocktail. The reason I don't care for the three piece, it works fine. However, um, if we don't make cocktails every day, this little piece, the cap on top tends to get lost. And without fail, when you shake this thing, uh, when you go to take off the secondary piece, it gets stuck and it becomes very difficult to break that seal. Uh, it's, um, I, amateur hour, uh, forgot my cocktail shaker. I had all my tools. I was doing the Steve Harvey show and uh, they last minute ran back to the prop uh, show. I had everything else, glass where I brought my own ice and I went and looked in my bag and I forgot to put the shaker in. They're like, oh, here we go. We have this. And they gave me this metal three piece shaker. And I knew immediately, I'm like, this thing is going to stick. And I'm on like television with a studio audience right now. And sure, sure enough, it's stuck. And I had to put it underneath the bar and do a little uh, you know, jiggle to get it, to get it, uh, to, to pop open. So, um, the two piece shaker, it takes a little bit of practice, but it, when it's ma well made, it seals well, and, and it, it really does do the trick before we put any liquid in this, I'm going to talk about real quickly, how we're going to use, uh, use this, uh, when you put your two shakers together, um, you want to put them in on an angle like this. So the small tin, you can see it creates a flush side. It's straight up and down. It is not what you might think. And you don't want the tin to be um, directly in line with the small tin with the, the large tin on an angle. So you have a flat side. It's going to seal much, much better. And it's going to stop it from getting stuck or help stop it from getting uh, stuck when we go to separate it when we make our cocktail. So it's just something to keep in mind. And I'm talking about this before we build our cocktail so the ice doesn't start melting in our drink while while I'm yappy. When we go to shake here in a minute after we build our cocktail, when I hold my shaker, I like to put two fingers on the end of my big shaker and I like to put a thumb of my other hand on my other on the, the end of my small shaker. That way when I'm shaking, if I'm, I didn't get a good seal for some reason and this comes apart, I have my fingers here holding it together as a kind of a backup plan. If you put your hands around it and it comes apart, you've got cocktail all over you. Uh, and uh, we don't want that. We want the cocktails in our bellies and in our glasses, not all over our shirts. All right, so just a couple of points. You'll see on the ingredient list that we sent you, the way um, they're listed very intentionally. Um, this cocktail essentially uh, is only three ingredients and you can take the recipe that we're gonna do for this and substitute whatever spirit you have at home and use it in this um, category of cocktail that we call a sour. So we're using whiskey, lemon juice, and simple syrup as the base basis of this 
um, cocktail. If you have gin at home, you can pop that in. If you have tequila at home, you can take out the whiskey and pop that in. Uh, and, the, and the proportions are going to generally work um, just the same. All right, so let's start, let's start mixing this thing. Is, who's, is, who's doing, is anyone doing a fresh egg white sour with this? Did anyone opt to do egg white with it? All right, excellent. If you didn't do egg white, no big deal. Uh, that's, again, it was, it's totally optional. The cocktail's still very delicious without it. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and separate my, separate my egg white into my tin. And, and I had mentioned in the notes that you could do this ahead of time because you really wanna make sure that you don't get any yolk when you, and, and when you do it, it'll stop it from frothing up. It'll stop it from emulsifying. So it's totally an option to do the egg white. This is a very classic way to make a sour. It's going to add some nice frothy texture to it. It dries the cocktail out a little bit and it gives it that kind of white head on the top of the cocktail as well. Optional, not, uh, not necessary. Uh, the next thing that we do, so you've got your jiggers, your jigger. Uh, and I always... Um, as you're learning to make cocktails, as you're making a cocktail at home, it is a really good idea to measure every time. So you can look at a cocktail the next time. Uh, and also you can adjust. If you have a drink and you make it, but you know, you get a recipe offline or out of a book and you're like, wow, that was great, but it was super sweet. If you've measured everything, you know, well, next time, instead of three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup, maybe I'm a half ounce person, whatever it might be. This is to taste. This is, you know, you're enjoying this cocktail. Your guests are enjoying this cocktail, your family, whomever you're making the drink for. Uh, and so the, any recipe is a guideline. We're not baking. And so if you change things up a little bit to your taste, nothing's going to fall apart. Nothing's going to collapse. And at the end of the day, even a so-so cocktail is still um, a cocktail. So it's not like you, you, you worked all day for, um, you worked all day for three hours and then you had to order pizza or something because you burnt the, because uh, you burnt something. So the nice thing about with these jiggers and you'll see inside they're marked uh, with the lines for each of your, your measurements. They start at the ounce, then it goes half, three quarter, one, one and a half and two ounces uh, is the top line. Um, and that is kind of, and it actually will read and tell you what uh, it says the number on it. The problem, a lot of times when you get jiggers at the store, they have either no lines on the inside or they don't, lines don't tell you what they are. Uh, and so it can be a little bit uh, confusing. So uh, um, we're going to start off with our simple syrup here, and that's three quarters of an ounce. Hey, Charles. Yeah. There's a quick question about egg whites. Yeah. Why should we not be using boxed egg whites in a drink? It, there's something about the pasteurization that they do with those egg whites uh, that does not froth up the same way uh, that a fresh uh, They just never work quite as well uh, to me and in, in my experience. Uh, so simple syrup first. Next, we're going to do an ounce of our lemon juice. And I'll talk about lemon juice real quickly as we do this. Uh, as we, we'll get to this point. So we're using fresh lemons um, and there's a number of ways to do this. I just wanted to, to demo this at home. Um, my lemon today is pretty ridiculous. I don't know if you can see how big this thing is. It's, it's bigger than my oranges, uh, which is pretty amazing. But luckily my citrus press is um, a size that works. Um, you may have hopefully already squeezed your lemon juice and had it ready ahead of time. But I just wanted to show you the proper way uh, to do this and talk about some quick tips on this. So um, your citrus, when you squeeze it, uh, should be room temperature. A lot of us keep our citrus in the fridge, uh, which is fine to store it and to keep it, to preserve it for a longer period of time. But if you know you're going to make cocktails that evening, if you know you're going to be squeezing it for cooking or anything else, take them out and let them get to room temp. A cold piece of citrus will yield much less um, juice than, than one that is uh, room temperature. Uh, and if you need to in a pinch, I've seen people toss them in the microwave for 10 seconds as well to warm them up real quickly. If you're using a simple hand press like this is a super efficient way to do it. Uh, if you go down to, uh, to Mexico, uh, the bars that do super high volume out in San Francisco, one of the top tequila bars in the world called Tommy's, uh, they put out God knows how many margaritas a night uh, when they're open and they do everything from a hand press. Uh, so this is when I first opened my first cocktail bar was called the drawing room here in Chicago. We only had these 
for the first year. And then um, the owners finally caved and got us an electric juicer so we can uh, you know, bang it out. And that was like the best gift I've ever been given uh, to do that. So when you cut your fruit, when you are using this, um, you put the cut side down into uh, the press. Sometimes the tendency is to put the cut side up because the curve looks like it should fit that way. If you do that and you squeeze it, it will squirt you right in the face. Uh, and nobody likes citric acid in their eyeball. And if you do, then, you know, more power. Have a good night uh, and have fun with it. So when you do it, we're just going to do a quick squeeze with that. And when you squeeze it in, give it that final turn as well so you don't lose any of that great citrus on the end. And then before you use it as well, um, go ahead and... Uh, you always want to run your, your lemon juice through a fine strain or something like this. Um, lemon juice, orange juice, grapefruit juice gets pulpy and gets seeds in it. You'll want to fine strain it. Lime juice does not need to be it. Typically when you squeeze it with that kind of a press, it does not need to be fine strained. Uh, so you're doing pretty good. All right. So uh, last but not least, you see, we saved the whiskey for last. Um, this is the way we build cocktails because in case we make a mistake while we're building our drinks, um, we, are dumping out sugar water and a little bit of lemon. We're not dumping out delicious, delicious whiskey if we make a mistake along the way. So we know we have our cocktail built correctly up to this point. The whiskey is gonna be the last thing that we add. So we're, we don't toss that out. So two ounces of our whiskey. And that's the, that's the top line of your jigger. If you have one of these craft house jiggers there, uh, it is not all the way to the top of the, the jigger, it's to the top line. That was, I designed that very, um, very specifically, no ice yet. We're gonna add the ice last. Um, so it does not go to the top line. Most jiggers, their, their, their final measure will be to surface tension. And to me, that just leads to spilling, uh, spilling all over the place. Just, or, um, Charles, we have a question from Justin over here, my brother-in-law who's sitting yeah, across from me. Is it okay if he uses three ounces instead of two? <laughs> uh, I would say make two cocktails and put them in two glasses. Uh, it's um, in this case, three ounces will definitely throw off the cocktail uh, or just save the extra ounce on the side for a sidecar, maybe. <laughs> Derek, does, does Justin know there's one more cocktail after this? He does, yes, he's not driving. <laughs> okay. Three cocktails in an hour is a pretty good, it's a pretty good party um, where I'm from. So at this point, for those of you that used egg white only, if you don't have egg white, wait for the next step. For those of you that use egg white, we're gonna do what's called a dry shake. Uh, and it's gonna emulsify and everything together. There is no ice in the tin yet. Go ahead, put your, um, seal up your shaker. And then give it a shake to tie everything together. You're emulsifying and breaking up that egg white. And when you open your shaker, you'll hear, you probably hear a little hiss, especially if you have the Boston shaker, the two piece shaker, you'll hear those gases uh, escaping. Uh, and what you're doing now without this step, you're building up the froth. If you don't do the dry shake, you will not get the froth in the top. Of the if you're deciding to use any berries in this as well, I threw that in there as an option because any type of berry would work great in this cocktail. Uh, you can toss those in uh, also. Charles, can you, can you do egg white and berries? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've got my little, my, my ice bucket ready to rock and roll. Um, this is actually, this is not to, this was one of the craziest things. Like as a bartender, I was like, ah, an ice bucket. That's, that's the one tool I don't use as a bartender uh, at the bar. But when we designed this thing, we really looked at, um, ways to improve upon it. So we made it a big oval as opposed to making it that tall narrow uh, so you can actually scoop into it and get to your ice. And then um, I have an antique and vintage. Uh, nine year old someone uh, that loves to go, uh, uh, that loves antiques, probably from being raised by my grandmother. Uh, it, and you can see a lot of that in the design of my, my barware and glassware. Uh, but holes uh, at the bottom of the bucket, and, and we did that as well. And it allows, as the ice melts, uh, to drain away from your fresh ice, so it's not sitting in a pool of water. And if you're scooping your ice out of a bowl or something right now, 
Uh, you want to make sure that you're not scooping up tons of water. Drain that water off so we're not adding a bunch of dilution to our cocktail when we ice up our tin. And really, about halfway full on the tin is all you need to go. Don't fill it up all the way. You don't need to go. Um, we don't need to go too, um, too, too high with it. Halfway is, is totally fine. All right, I'm going to show you this once uh, before we all do it together. It'll be kind of fun for us to um, do this cocktail together. I'm going to seal up my shaker here. You can give it a little tap. You can press it together. Uh, a well-made shaker will, will seal together if you get it. Again, remember, it is on an angle. That top tin is on an angle, uh, and so it creates one flat side. Um, when you shake this thing, I'm going to show you this. So when you shake it with the Boston shaker, it creates a seal. Uh, so I can turn that's turned upside down. If you can see, um, don't do that for, if it's your first time shaking a cocktail, uh, do it over your sink for the first time you try that. But that is the magic seal. Everything just expands and creates an airtight liquid seal. So let's go ahead and give this a really nice shake together. Excellent, nice job. <laughs> and then um, for, your, for your Boston shakers, when you're going to get this apart, again, like we've created an airtight seal. All you need to do is create any tiny air gap between these two tins and they'll release very easily. So one way is to give it a little tap and wiggle it out. You can squeeze your, your large tin and wiggle it out. Uh, it's um, Anything, anything that you can do to create the tiniest air gap and it'll, it will release. Um, and, and sometimes it gets stuck. Uh, the seal is just a little bit too good. I've seen the most professional of bartenders uh, get their, their shakers stuck together. Um, next, we have our, you should have a cocktail glass of some time, whether you have a coupe style, which is the rounded style, which is quite popular if you've been out to cocktail bars in the last several years. Uh, if you have the V-shaped, uh, martini glass that kind of uh, came into vogue through the 50s, 60s, uh, 70s. Um, these are, you know, this is really like, we've landed in the middle nicely with our glassware. Uh, and and um, like the glass I'm using is about probably a 10 ounce volume, nine and a half, 10 ounce volume. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, it didn't do us any favor. The glasses got in, in, uh, enormous, 14 ounce glasses. Uh, and so we've come back down to a sensible size uh, glass. So next, Go ahead and put your strainer on if you're using this. The strainer at the spring is called a Hawthorne strainer. The spring goes down. You put one finger over the top of it to hold it on. Uh, and then go ahead and strain it straight into your glass. Ooh. And the last thing that starts to come out is that really beautiful froth. If you have, uh, if you're using the cobbler shaker or the three piece, it has the strainer built into this style of shaker. Um, but again, it's, it's a little bit slow when you're doing this thing the whole time, which is, which is fine, but it's just. Uh, hey, hey, Charles. Yeah. Austin, do we miss the bitters? No, we're going to put the bitters on top. Okay, very good. So you, can, you can put the bitter, we could have put the bitters into the cocktail. Sometimes I'll do both. Um, put them into the tin and shake them with the bitters and then add some extra on top. So last but not least, we're gonna add our um, bittered sling bitters and we've chosen plum and root beer from them. Uh, you know, typically if, if you guys make cocktails at home already uh, and if you have any bitters at your house, you probably have Angostura bitters. And that really is the workhorse of, of the bar world. It's these with the white paper on them. Uh, and this is typically what we have. Uh, at our homes. And, and again, it really is, this is a, an aromatic bitter. Uh, Bittered Sling makes one of those as well. It's called Kensington bitters. Uh, they're, they're in general, their stuff is just like very high quality. They're using really high caliber botanicals for all the infusions. And this is a little bit more fun and the flavors go great. I actually just um, baked some uh, oatmeal and um, peanut butter cookies. And I used some of these bitters in the batter before I, I cooked them down and like had that really went well with the molasses flavor. So go ahead and just dash a little bit on top. And 
And then I just like to do the most important thing here. And, and uh, does everyone uh, have a glass and some, a cocktail or something resembling such? Cheers. 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 Wow. All right, I see some thumbs up. How did you guys do out there? All right. So again, as I, uh, as I said, these recipes are a guideline. So if this is too dry <laughs> for you, add a little bit more simple syrup. If it's too tart for you, um, or if it's too sweet for you, cut back on that simple syrup. If you're Derek's brother-in-law, add another ounce of bourbon. <laughs> uh, what, you know, what, whatever, uh, whatever you are in the mood for, but feel free to tweak this a little bit. Uh, again, we could have shaken that with any kind of berries that you have. Some mint muddled into this would have been amazing. The foundation of this sour is so important. The basis of two ounces of spirit, one ounce of citrus, either lemon or lime, and three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup is a great launch pad to make sour cocktails. It's the how I start my margarita, two ounces of Blanco tequila, one ounce of lime, three quarter ounce of simple syrup or agave nectar, um, so many cocktails that you have. Anything that has booze, citrus, and sweetener in it starts with a foundation like this. And so uh, really, really forgiving. Orange and grapefruit do not substitute straight in. They're not acidic enough to, to carry the cocktail and balance it. One quick uh, note on the simple syrup. The simple syrup that you guys received is what we call a uh, one-to-one -one ratio. And that's kind of the, the, the workhorse of the, the cocktail world. Um, just any, you know, plain white sugar, uh, one part sugar measured out, you know, whatever it is, four ounces of sugar, four ounces of hot water mixed together until it's um, fully dissolved and, and, and you've got it there. Do not build your simple syrup in the same mixing cup. Don't put four ounces of sugar in a mixing cup and then pour up until you get to eight ounces with water. It it's, throws it off because that water is going mixing in with the, the sugar and it will throw off your ratio. Uh, as you do that, measure them separately and combine them. Um, you don't need to boil it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you do not want to boil it. You can apply some heat and do it in a pot on the stove. But all we're doing is literally dissolving the equal amount of sugar in water, put it in a bottle and keep it in, in your fridge. You've got simple syrup to add to your coffee, uh, to make mocktails or lemonade or, or anything else like that, or, or certainly in our case, um, cocktails. I'm gonna pass this off to my assistant because uh, I know there's another cocktail coming. Um, there's yes, a, question. So I see a question that just popped up. Yeah. Um, you, I often will use, uh, this is a good question is about, can you bring other sorts of sugars into the mix? Absolutely. I actually often, uh, and at the, when I was at the time, we only use refined sugar, like a temporary sugar. Same thing, one to one. And the sugar that I made the old fashioned syrup is, is a demerara unrefined sugar. It's not brown sugar. Brown sugar oftentimes um, just has caramel coloring added to it. Um, but a demerara sugar, it, it's, it's less refined than white, um, than white sugar is. It has more flavor. Uh, if you have a, 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 um, a, a Hispanic market, like, I've, like uh, where I live, like my closest grocery store is actually um, services the, the uh, widely the Mexican community around me. Piloncillo is a, is a type of unrefined sugar. It has tons of flavor. It's in like a cone. Uh, you can use coconut sugar. You can use monk fruit sugar, whatever in the, whatever you want to get down with. You may have to, if you use something like agave, do some adjusting and, and just taste as you go along. And before you poured your cocktail, you could have used your bar spoon and taken a sip or taken a straw and just done a straw taste test and then adjusted before you poured it as well. And just like cooking, you would never make, um, you know, a pasta sauce or something like that and not taste it before you served it. So feel free to taste your cocktails while you're building them and you'll get better at tasting uh, and adjusting them to your palate as you go along. All right, uh, the next cocktail uh, we're gonna make is the old fashioned. I wanted to do one shaken cocktail and one stirred cocktail, very opposite ends of the spectrum, but they represent two styles of cocktails that are the two main branches of the family tree of, of cocktails. There are many, many branches, um, but the two mains would, would, one would be the sour cocktails, like we just did with the whiskey sour, anything that has spirit, sweetener, and citrus. 
Uh, and then the other would be the spirit forward cocktails, those that have no fruit juice in them, no citrus in them, things like your Manhattan, your Old Fashioned, your Rob Roy, your Martini. Um, and they're very like spirit driven cocktails. Uh, and the Old Fashioned is absolutely on fire right now. It is the cocktail of the moment. Uh, if the Cosmopolitan had the late 80s and early 90s, the Old Fashioned has come back in force and is the cocktail of today. And I've got no problem with the good Cosmo. Actually, when you make it, you can do it to the spec that we just did that whiskey sour. And it's absolutely um, delicious. I actually was just on a, a Zoom conference, a Zoom uh, class with the three people that were credited with the popularization and the first wave of cocktails of the Cosmopolitan. And done right, it's just a vodka sour with a little bit of uh, a kiss of cranberry and a little bit of triple sec. It's a really nice cocktail. It's really quite refreshing when it's done high quality. And my favorite uh, celebrity uh, guest experience ever was downstairs at the drawing room on Oak Street and Patrick Swayze and his wife, when he was filming his last television series, he was filming in Chicago, came in and um, Roadhouse, you know what he drank? Cosmos. So if, uh, if Roadhouse can drink Cosmos uh, and look cool doing it, we all can drink Cosmos and look cool doing it. Doing it. So anyways, uh, so the old fashioned there. Um, super easy drink to build three ingredients again and then and then our garnish being the fourth but three ingredients super easy uh, to do super um, uh, easy to do at home and also very forgiving as well so your glass you're going to take some kind of rocks glass or old-fashioned glass this one that i'm holding here we would call a DOF or a double old fashioned glass that's it's quite large and so it has a, a, quite a bit of room in it. The old fashioned glass is named after the cocktail, um, not the other way around, um, because when uh, this cocktail first came about, and this was a red hot cocktail all through uh, the 1800s uh, and, and got its name, its official name, old fashioned in the late 1800s, um, but the glass. Uh, the drink was built straight into the glass and it was often with a very unrefined sugar. And so uh, they would need to mull that. Uh, we're going to take our old fashioned glass. And as I said in the notes, you have two options. You can build this straight in um, your glass. Uh, if you want to, or you can use a mixing glass and build it in the mixing glass just for the sake of, um, of, of showing you guys uh, the build on this recipe. I'm going to do it in my mixing glass and then pour it into my uh, cocktail glass, but feel free 100% to build straight into your, your old fashioned glass as well. Uh, it's, it's absolutely fine to do that. You just might want to give it a little bit of an extra stir. This is a slow sipper cocktail. And so as you're doing it, the ice that we're going to have in our um, final cocktail, we want that dilution as it, it just mellows out the whiskey. We're essentially drinking straight whiskey with just enough sugar and a dash of bitters to round out the edges. All right. So before we do that, can we start? I'm going to make our garnish first. Um, so does everyone have an orange? Uh, and there are, uh, there are a few ways to do this. And I realize you're like, God, all this talking for two cocktails. But uh, hopefully some, we get some tips and tricks. So when we make our cocktails um, in the future, uh, we can, we can uh, uh, get through them a little bit. Uh, a little bit easier. Charles, you keep you keep talking away because you're giving me more ideas for us to talk about offline. We're we're actually coming up with a dark matter collab uh, that's going to oh. be available in Whole Foods um, and on Amazon. So I want you involved in that. So oh you, keep God, talking, you keep giving me ideas, Charles. I used to. If you guys don't know Dark Matter Coffee, um, amazing local roaster. Uh, I used to live two blocks away from their original. They had one tiny shop on Chicago Avenue, and uh, the owner would deliver two pounds of coffee downtown to our tiny cocktail bar himself. It was early on, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty amazing uh, back in the day. Okay, so I'm gonna show you this before we get started. There are a few ways to get your garnish off of your orange. Uh, and um, you can, the easiest way is probably to do, use, put your orange on your cutting board, uh, use a knife 
and cut away from yourself. Obviously, always be safe, be safe when you're doing it and cut a little strip away from yourself. And if you guys can see what I'm doing here, uh, I'm just, I don't want to get the, the fruit if possible. Uh, I never cut my garnishes this way. I'll show you the way I do it. Um, but this is the easy way to get started doing it. And it gives you something that looks like this. I don't have any fruit attached to it. Uh, some people sometimes will go back and cut some of the pith off. If I was at this point, you have a very don't squeeze it because all the other holes in this kit we want on the finished cocktail. Um, so the other way to get a strip like this, and what we do in the bar in, in the bars is we use a, a peeler, and, and it's a Y peeler is the peeler of choice. Uh, if anyone's ever worked in a kitchen before, you will never see the potato peelers that we grew up with in our house that are the long thin ones. Uh, all chefs use um, a Y peeler or one this shape. It's just a little faster, it has better control. Um, when you are using one of these peelers, especially any new, old, whatever, um, treat it like a knife. Uh, it is, that blade is very, very sharp. Always treat this as a knife. Um, and we actually have a little garnish kit with all of these tools together and the, a, little, uh, a little prep knife and, uh, and, and the peeler. So you can use this vegetable peeler to do the exact same thing and cut. And it takes a little bit of practice to get this right, but to peel off and cut a nice big wide swath of, um, of orange peel there. So the other way, and I'll, I'll show you that when we're done, is to use a channel knife. You guys might have one of these sitting in your kitchen drawer, and you're like, what the heck does that do? Like, it's a tool that we, get, we got and we've never used it. Sometimes there's little holes in the top of, the, in the top of this tool, uh, and that's for zesting uh, as well. But you can cut a nice long twist, and I'll show you how to do that at the end of it. Because if you do a twist with the channel knife, you want to uh, do it over the top of your cocktail. Because as you use this tool, all of this beautiful oil comes out. And we're not putting this twist on our cocktail just for visual. The main reason we're going to do it, we're going to squeeze it at the end of the drink, is for this beautiful citrus aroma. Uh, and so uh, it is. I cannot um, emphasize enough the importance of aroma when it comes to cocktails or food. Uh, our mouths uh, have receptors for five things, sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami. But our noses, our ol olfactory sense has receptors and is able to pick up thousands and thousands of aromas. And so what we associate as taste ultimately and flavor uh, is those five core, those five core um, tastes and then all the wonderful aromas along with texture and temperature and everything else. And that's what makes our food delicious. So I've got my twist. I'm gonna go ahead and give this just one extra bit of attention because we taste with our eyes. I've got a little prep knife. This style of knife is the one I like to use. It's known as a petty knife. Uh, it's bigger than a paring knife, but not as big as a chef's knife. And it's great for all purpose stuff. I don't care for paring knives behind the bar because if you have a grapefruit sized lemon, you might not get through the other side of it. Or if you have a grapefruit, uh, you might not get through the other side of it. So I'm just giving this four little quick, four quick slices and now i've got a lovely parallelogram so it just looks a little more attractive my dog has just got the zoomies uh excuse me he's coming back for another round and there he goes baby <laughs> since we've been in quarantine he's gotten really used to when i'm behind the bar and, I, and just talking to this black box on a, uh, in front of me he likes to sit on the chair next to me and usually keeps me company. But right now, he decided to do laps uh, in the midst of in the midst of all this. All right. So I've been in several ahead. meetings where dogs run and they call it zoomies in every one. That's funny you said that. When a dog <laughs> runs, yeah. everybody says, "Oh, there's a zoomie." <laughs> it, it literally was. It just, yes, I've got like a, a racetrack around my house right now. Uh, all right. So we're going to start and, and build our cocktail. We can go ahead and add our ice to our cocktail since we're building in this shorter glass. If we put the liquid in first and then add the ice, it's going to splash out all over the place. When we're doing it in our cocktail tin, there's enough room in there that we shouldn't have a problem. So I'm going to put the ice in and I use the silicone mold just to freeze a little bit of a bigger cube, but any, any ice cube is fine. So like I just use a silicone mold and I've got a couple of these, these bigger ice cubes and, and you can get those anywhere. Um, 
Actually, there's a company in Chicago called Lang Ice, uh, and they make, uh, you can buy bags of their ice. Some Marianos carry it, and it's their classic cubes, and they're brilliant, beautiful ice cubes for three bucks a bag. Uh, this really dense, big, chunky, wonderful ice. It's not that typical store ice that you're smashing on the ground and you, you get, and it's like an, an iceberg. So, um, so we've got, we've got our, our, our ice in our, um, in our glass. Let's go ahead and use our bitters and, and, and start with that. And just a few dashes of bitters. You can always add more. And if you get, um, I put in that list, you know, where you can get bittered slings. There's a really great uh, liquor store in California uh, called Bitters and Bottles. It's a tiny, tiny liquor store out by the airport and that's by SFO. Um, but they ship uh, nationally. And if you, if you get that online, uh, the bigger bottles have the eyedropper in them as well. So uh, you can eye drop in and be a little bit more precise, but the little dasher bottles are awesome. Uh, and they're great because um, you can uh, you can travel with them as well. So if you need to do some airplane mixology, uh, you, you've got your you've got your bitters with you as well. And the TSA, you can just be like, yes, this, 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 we're doing this right now because they, they took they took booze off airplanes. You got a BYO now. So yeah, so all right, so uh, bitters. The next thing we're going to do is our coffee syrup. Uh, and you know, start with half ounce max. I'm going to go third of an ounce for my taste because I know where my palate is and I like it a little bit drier. So I'm going to go just above that bottom bump line on my, on my jigger. That, that little detail here on your jigger uh, is actually the quarter ounce mark. So I'm going to go just above that to get myself a third of an ounce because I can always add more. You can't get that sweetness. It's harder to get out of the glass once it's in there, but I can always go back and add a little bit more. We'll talk about um, this syrup quickly is um, a smoked coffee syrup, and it sounds fancier than it is. Um, this, you know, we talked about the simple syrup for the whiskey sour being a one-to-one -one simple syrup, uh, which is the, like the workhorse. It's what you're gonna use for almost all of your cocktails. This is a two-to-one syrup two parts sugar, and we used a, 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 an unrefined Demerara sugar, sugar in the raw, the brand name is fine, whatever. Uh, you use turbinado sugar, uh, two parts sugar, one part hot water uh, by volume. That you need probably to have on the stove because you have so much uh, solid that's going into less liquid. You need to have that bit of heat going and just stir it. And as soon as it dissolves, get it off the heat. Again, don't let it boil. For this coffee syrup, the only thing I did, instead of using water, I used coffee. So I, I, you can use cold brew and heat it up on your stove with the sugar if you want to. For this, uh, I, I, I um, used a really nice uh, coffee to do all your syrup. And then I realized that I forgot to save some for myself. So I had my press pot in the morning and I made myself a cup of coffee out of it. And I took some of that extra coffee and made myself a few ounces of syrup. Uh, to have for our class tonight. So really, really- Charles, Charles, sorry to interrupt. I know people are asking for the recipe for that coffee syrup. So if, yep. it's, if it's possible, yep. if you can find it in the uh, kindness of your heart uh, to share it with us. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, and, and the way I'll show you the way I, I, I smoked the sugar ahead of time. Uh, and I will show you, um, I'll show you how to uh, do that in just a second yeah. as well. Charles, just, just a quick time check. It's 6.55. Yeah. Um, so we can like finish the drink and then whoever wants to hang around, you can yeah. show them how to, how to make the syrup. Yeah, I'm good. Sorry. I, I, I tend to, I tend to, no, yeah, this I, is great. I'll turn it over to you guys after we're done here, um, doing this. So last ingredient, you've got bitters, you've got your coffee syrup in your glass or in, um, your, I said I was going to do it in my mixing glass and I started building in my rocks glass. So I'm going to do it right in my rocks glass. Uh, two ounces of your whiskey. Here is actually a place where if you were to, you know, slip and another half ounce went in this cocktail, it's gonna, it would not um, throw off the balance. It would be, it would be fine. You can stir it down, add a little more dilution, or you can just put a little spoonful extra syrup in there as well. Totally up to you to taste. Um, now I actually, so I wanna show you guys the stirring technique. If you're at that point in your mixing glass, go ahead and feel free to stir in your mixing glass. I just wanna to show the stirring technique do this in my mixing glass. So when we stir, we see these bar spoons and they always have this twist on them oftentimes. 
the tendency when we see this is it makes us think we're supposed to go like this and do some kind of like twisting motion, which is not very efficient. Like as soon as I did that, it actually just shot ice out of, <laughs> out of my, um, uh, out of my glass. So we take our, uh, our spoon, it goes into our mixing glass or our, um, or our cocktail glass, the bowl of the spoon, the curved side of the spoon against the outside of the glass. Think about the way that that's going to um, run smoothly around the outside of your glass. If you were to do it the other way, it would not be, it would not be smooth. And then you, you get it um, between your fingers and whatever feels comfortable. Uh, I put three fingers on one side and one on the other. And it actually ends up being a push and pull motion that gets, that gets smoothed out. So I have the, um, the back of the spoon against the glass. I pull towards myself. I use my pinky to push away. I use my top fingers to pull towards myself, my pinky to push away. As you connect those motions, and the top of your spoon pretty much stays in the same place, it turns into a, a, a smooth stir. It takes a little bit of practice, but once you get it, you're like, ah, it's like the light bulb goes off and you'll get a nice smooth stir. To start, anything you can do to get some dilution and some, some stirring is absolutely fine. The reason we stir this drink and don't shake it uh, is there's several reasons. As a general rule of thumb, when a cocktail has uh, any citrus in it or fruit juice in it, we shake it. When a cocktail is all spirits like this, we stir it. Uh, and going back traditionally, the martini was part of that. James Bond screwed up the martini for decades. Uh, and uh, I challenge uh, side by side uh, a shaken and a stirred martini. When you stir a cocktail, um, it's a much smoother texture. Uh, it has just a really lovely mouth feel to it. Um, when we're shaking or stirring, we're bringing down the temperature, we're adding dilution. When you shake, you're, you, you're aerating immensely, millions of little bubbles in your cocktail and the texture on your, on your, on your tongue is so much different. Um, and I did this early, early in the, on in the, in the cocktail renaissance. Uh, I did this with a, a writer who didn't believe me and I shook a Manhattan and I stirred a Manhattan side by side. They look completely different and the texture you cannot um, overstate how different they are to one another. So I've got my cocktail here. I am straining it off into the glass. You guys may have done that as well already, or you have it in your glass. Now, go ahead, before you put in your citrus, if you're not already, smell your glass. Smell the, like the cocktail, take a tiny sip of it. Mm. Now, uh, watch me do this real quickly. I'm gonna use my, my other peel and just do it on my hand and see if I can't get a visual for this. With the peel facing my hand, I'm gonna squeeze this and try and get the oils to, to show up on the camera. They may or may not do it, maybe not. But with one quick squeeze, um, the oils will come out. So you want the peel facing your cocktail because we're gonna eject the oils onto the top of our cocktail. One quick squeeze. Uh, you may see the oil actually hit the top of the drink. Give it a second squeeze. You can do a little twist with it, whatever you want to do. I like to, and I've got this nice parallelogram, so I like to put it on top there and add a nice little garnish because we taste with our eyes as well. And, and when we bring that up to our, our mouths now, bring that up, you'll get that orange is the first thing that your nose is right over the top of that glass. Uh, there's no citrus in this cocktail, but it kind of tricks the mind. You have all of the spirit forward bourbon on the bottom end of this. Uh, and we have this bright citrus on the nose and it really helps to balance the drink and balance uh, the flavors and, and everything. And it just makes it a little bit nicer. Now for 200 level cocktail making, you could go one step further or for extra credit. And what I'm gonna do is take our box here. And this is probably my favorite toy that uh, we created in the in my part to alliance called a smoking box. And so it's a little cocktail smoker uh, with two doors on it and a glass side in it. And it's got a little food smoker on it, a little handheld smoker. I used this earlier to make the smoked sugar uh, syrup. Uh, I put the sugar in a plastic Ziploc bag. Uh, this has batteries in it and you put a little wood chips on top or anything else that you want to smoke and then it pumps the smoke out the other end sealed up the ziploc bag and kind of massaged it and let that sugar uh, absorb it you can use it in the kitchen as well 
so I hook it up here. I've got some hickory chips. We put our cocktail on the back door. Sorry, folks, this was not in your kit. We just couldn't fit it in. And then we just light up our- Next class, Disha, yeah. next class. You can probably see the smoke starting to fill the box. And just, we just let it in there for a second. And I actually put two doors on this. And I designed this because I had an old antique case that I drilled a hole in and did my smoker um, for this. And I used to hate having to open the lid and awkwardly reach in. So I put two doors on this so your guests can reach right in and grab their cocktail on the other side. But So now instead of a smoked old fashioned, we have a double smoked old fashioned in this case. Uh, does everyone have a cocktail ready? Cheers. Oh, Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. How does one come out? Fantastic. Uh, someone Fantastic. asked, uh, yes, this is hickory, but you can use any kind of fine wood chip for this. Uh, any kind of tea, broken up cinnamon, cedar, all sorts of different flavors, tons of food applications, um, whatever you wanted to do. If I wanted to take the syrup after I made it, add more smoke to it in like a mason jar and shake it to further infuse it and make it smokier. You see, I went light with the smoke because you can always add more, but again, you can't take it out once, uh, once you get going with it. All right, so we have some cocktails. I thank you so much for, for letting me rattle off for the, for the last hour uh, with you guys.